Well, lest I be thought negligent, happy Valentine's to everyone. I'll be sharing a little bit at the end of the message, a little bit of history about Valentine's. Some of you, I think, have heard the, something like this last year, but I want to refresh your memory, and also, maybe there's some of you haven't heard it. Valentine's has a very, very interesting history in the Christian church, and uh, it has some very precious roots, and we want to let you know that. Well, I was hoping we would get through Colossians 4 before uh, Pastor Tony got here, but time caught up with us. And so we're going to finish a, a big chunk of Colossians 3 today, uh, 12 to 17. And uh, we'll see if maybe when he goes on vacation or something uh, at some point, maybe we'll pick it up again. I, I hope you folks will remember everything we say. So anyway, and we we're looking for Tony to be here uh, the first Sunday of March. So that's the, uh, that's the plan at this point. Colossians 3, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, tender mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness or completeness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, better turn this on, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the scripture. Thank you for your divine word and your divine appointments that you bring us to each day. We pray that you would enrich our hearts today. Bless those that have been preparing the after meal, and we thank you for their diligent service. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we're losing you now. Am I losing you? Yeah, I don't know if you're, you're this, not plugging all the way or? No, it's... Okay, I'll turn it on again. Yeah, okay. Let's see if we lose it again. Something's wrong with the battery. Yeah, that's what I was just talking about. Okay. If not, I may have to use that and just or pick up one of those things. Because... I want you to keep your Bibles open. And turn with me. Because today, it's a great day. Last time I preached to you, I talked about all the things, you know, the, the, the clothing of a Christian. What we're supposed to put off. It's hot here. Now. Huh? Okay. Must be my. Um, here. That's okay. I'll just, let's, let's, just, let's just go. Good plan B. You want the cordless or? I'll work right here. You won't get to see me walk around very much. Am I coming through? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, we had a situation where we learned about what we're supposed to put off. And there was all kinds of yucky stuff. You know, uh, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affections, and, 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 and all of those kinds of things. And, and God is saying, as Christians, even though those might be our natural bent, we're to put them off and put them aside. 
The word that he uses to put on and to put off is like clothing, but it's also like habits. Basically, what we're saying is our natural habits are towards the world. What we need to do is we need to acquire new habits. And I have good news. How long does it take to acquire a habit? How long does it take? Well, I'm no professional psychologist. Thank the Lord. Anyway, I'm no professional psychologist, but I do know that people that deal with this sort of thing, people who deal with, there's a, I'll give you a fancy word here, kinesiology. That is, if you're a PE major, you know what that is. That's the science of how your body works. We also call it muscle memory. How long does it take to acquire? If, I want, if I'm coaching somebody in a baseball swing, if I'm coaching somebody in a golf swing, or maybe in how to make a basket, to acquire a habit with constant practice, it takes about three weeks. Be be before it actually becomes somewhat second nature, then it takes another three to six weeks to perfect and where it really becomes second nature and comes to the forefront. You know, that's pretty good news. Because that's the way God wants us to put things on. And sometimes, it, notice here it says in verse 12, he says to put on. Now that's like putting on a pair of clothes. Now somebody, a couple weeks ago, they were commenting on the fact that I had on a pair of jeans. You know, anybody here ever buy a new pair of jeans? I mean, go ahead, confess. Now when you put those things on, when you put those things on, are they just nice and soft and warm and... No. No, what are they? They're stiff. They don't feel right. What do you got to do to make them feel right? You got to wash them. You got to wear them. You got to beat on them. Use them a little bit. But once they've been washed like these have twice, they're about the best feeling pants that I've got. Okay? That's the way it is with habits. That's the way it is with righteous living. Sometimes when we put on righteous living, it feels stiff. It's not the natural way we think. We try to read the Bible. It's boring. We, try, oh, we can't understand it. You know, and, and all of this, all these other things that come up. But the point is, is if you want it bad enough, you'll go through the discipline that it takes to acquire the new habit. Now, nobody is saying that everybody's going to be an Olympic ski jumper or a snowboarder, but we can still acquire the proper habits, you know. I've gone skiing in years gone by. Don't know that I'd want to do that right this minute. But I've gone skiing in years gone by. And I've been able to get down the hill. I was talking to my wife. We were watching the Olympics yesterday and these downhill skiers going about 70 miles an hour. You know, whipping down that hill. And I said, I could train from now till the cows come home. <laughs> I guess they want me to. Well, we had some problems with those batteries for some reason. But okay, let's, well. try, let's try this again. Then you, okay. And then you can roam about. All right. Am I on now? Yeah. Okay. And I can, you know, and I can do that. But I can train till the cows come home. I'll never be an Olympic skier. I could run with the best of them. I could get my heart to the point to where I could run a marathon. I'll never win the Boston Marathon. I might be able to finish it. 
Maybe. You know, the point is, we sometimes get discouraged because we're not the Olympians of spirituality or righteous living. Don't be. Just be in the race. Just be in the race and run it properly according to good biblical principles. Notice what he says. Therefore, as the elect of God, you have been chosen. You are holy. You're set apart. That's what that word means. You're set apart. But more than just being set apart, well, this is something that we're going to set up here on the pedestal and, and say, isn't that pretty? No. You are set apart and you're loved. He says you're loved. He says, put on tender mercies. Now what does tender mercies mean? It simply means we need to work to have a life that is forgiving. We need to have a life that is willing to go out of their way, our way, to help when help is needed. It may not be in front of everybody. Nobody may see you when you give a hand to somebody with a broken down tire. And you know what? The few times I've had the opportunity to do that, in my life, I remember one guy we were going through the gorge up in, and it was snowing and he was having a heck of a time getting his chains on. Well, I'm in my Abeka suit <laughs> and I took off the jacket and got down underneath there and, and we latched it up. You know, and he was ready to give me a hundred dollar bill. I mean, he didn't care. He was ready. To, and I said, you know, no problem. You know what I didn't ask him? I didn't ask him, hey, are you a Christian? Hey, are you gay? Are you straight? Are, are, you know, all of these things. Because if we're going to show mercy, none of that matters. We show mercy the way God shows mercy. Show me once in the New Testament when Christ healed someone and asked them about their theology. Show me once. He doesn't. The only thing he ever asked anybody was when he met the man at the well, he says, do you want to get well? In other words, are you willing to take on the response, if I do heal you, <laughs> it's going to change your life in more ways than one. You're going to have to start being responsible. So the first step as a Christian, we ought to be known as people who exercise mercy. Now that doesn't mean that we're saps. <laughs> okay? That doesn't mean that, that, that we, we get used. But when we see people in real need that we have the opportunity to meet, we ought to put on that behavior, even if it inconveniences us. What about kindness and humbleness of mind? Kindness simply means here is someone who is willing to go out of their way to show deeds to people that we know that need things done. Humbleness of mind. Are we willing to say, I don't know it all? Are we willing to say that and mean it and understand it? What about
about meekness? That's something we ought to put on. Now, when most people think of meekness, they think of the old Marlboro cigarette commercial. There was a cigarette commercial out there. And you, had, you see this big cowboy on there. And I mean, he's built like a brick. You know? He's got his cowboy hat on and everything and his rough shirt on and his jeans and sitting in the saddle with his cigarette. And it says, Marlboro cigarettes, mild but not meek. Now, when we think of meekness, we think of somebody that's a namby-pamby, sometimes called a panty waist. That's what, that's the thing that comes to our thing. But that is not what the Bible refers to when it refers to meekness. The term meekness is a term that was used of a stallion or a very feisty mare that was broken to plow. They have all the tremendous strength of a horse. They could crush you with one kick. But all it takes to move them is the slight touch on the neck or on the tummy. of the person driving the plow, riding the horse, driving the carriage. They are strength under control. And the person that touches your neck through the ministry of the Holy Spirit is God himself. That's what being meek is all about, scripturally. And that ought to bless you. Because God's not asking us to be a wuss. He's asking us to have the character to stand. When it's necessary. And then long-suffering. We ought to put that on too. Long-suffering means patience. It means we're willing to let people... Underst we understand that people are going to be people. I'm going to foul things up. You're going to foul things up. We all are. And we're going to give each other a lot of rope. Understanding that in reaching down in God's grace, He gave us a lot of rope. Now that doesn't mean we tolerate sin. But it means our attitude towards the sinner is merciful and receptive. And not lording over. Notice what it goes on to say. He says, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you. So also do he. And then he says, above all things, put on love. Now that term love is the, actual, is the Greek word agapain. It's the love that says, it's not an emotional kind of love. Although that's, cer that's certainly not a bad thing. But he's not saying here, you know, come to the point to where you can just embrace everybody in a, in a hoochie-coochie way and, and, and just, oh, it's so wonderful. 
That's not what he's saying. He says, put on agape. It means we do right to people because they're made in the image of God and that's the only justification we need to do right to people. While we were yet sinners and enemies of God, what did He do? He loved us. He agape us. And that's what He's saying here for people. Do ye. And above all of these things, and above all of these things, remember that which is the bond and the term that he uses is perfectness in the King James. It actually means completeness. It's the, it's the glue that should bind churches and people together. Then he goes on. It says, let the peace of God, which is interesting, the way it's translated in the King James, it says, let's the peace of God. But the actual Greek word is Christu. It's not Theos, which is the normal word for God. It's Christu, which means let the peace of Christ. Just let the peace of Christ. Some of your translations may have it the accurate way. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which also you are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Not in the sense of the Pharisee that prayed before God, I thank God that I'm not as other men. That you didn't create me a man, that you didn't create me a woman, and you didn't, rather you created me a man and not a woman and a cow. That was the typical prayer. That's not being thankful. That's being a hypocrite. That's thinking better of yourself than you ought to. Let our prayers be. Let our prayers be. Thank you, God. That from eternity past, you thought enough to die for me. And then he goes on to say, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace into your hearts unto the Lord. Let the word of Christ, what is the word of Christ? It's this book. Let it dwell in you richly. What does that mean? That means make it a part of your life. Make it a part of your soul. How do you renew your mind? You learn scripture. You put your mind under the discipline of scripture. If you're reading romance novels that you shouldn't be reading, put them away. If you want a romance novel, read Ruth. Read Esther. They're pretty good. Heck, read Song of Solomon. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And when that happens, when things come to tempt you, when things come and you have to make decisions, you can draw on a well that is not just wet and wide, but deep. And you can make good decisions. You can make godly decisions.
He says, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Well, what were the songs? Well, the psalms, that's pretty obvious. Those come out of the Bible. And there were other psalms as well. They didn't make it into the canon, but and there were others. What about hymns? Well, hymns are technically songs that teach truth. That teach truth. Historically, that's what a hymn means. And that's how the early church learned its theology. They sang hymns. And the hymns were rich with it. Now, what are spiritual songs? Spiritual songs we might put in the category of songs like the last song we sang. They're songs that do not have a direct theological bearing. The first few songs we sang were technically hymns this morning. If you look at them and you an and analyze them, they teach theology. That's what they do. And you'd be surprised how many people still get more of their theology out of the hymn book than they do out of the Bible. Because our minds work that way. We work with music. Not saying it's the best thing, but it is what it is. A spiritual song is like the last one. It's a song where we praise God, and we praise God according to proper ways of praising Him. But it doesn't really, I mean, you could say, well, it kind of infers that there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I mean, but it's not d designed to teach that. It's designed to have us focus our minds on those persons of the Trinity. That's what it is. And that's kind of why I picked the songs that I did. <clears throat> because I wanted you to kind of feel what the difference is for that. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks unto God the Father by Him. Do whatever you do in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now we can stand and we can say, oh, I'm doing this in the name of Jesus. Well, that's fine. But what he's after is our life and our deportment. Somebody on the outside should reasonably be able to conclude that it's, cons it's reasonably consistent. Now notice I'm not talking in absolute terms. We can't talk in absolute terms until we get to heaven. But people know what our focus is. People understand who we are. And when you get discouraged, don't be afraid to look around for encouragement. Because God will provide it. I was driving along. I'd just been to a school a week ago, Tuesday. And this school called and wanted to talk to me. And they weren't happy. Something to do with achievement tests not getting ordered right or they got the wrong things and now they're set up to do certain things and I had to go in and fix that mess and trust me when you've got a school that's with about five six hundred students and you've worked with them and you have boy I'm telling you when something goes south they go south well after a couple hours in a gracious way, but getting beat up by the principal, you know, and saying, you know, you guys need to fix this. And I'm on the phone and doing this and that and the other, and we finally got it fixed. But I walked out of there and I was exhausted. This was in the morning. And I still had two other schools to re reach that day. One of them was a brand new 
program. <clears throat> you know, and I'm sitting here, boy, I don't know if, I can, if I'm up for this or not. Well, I pulled out onto Interstate 5 in Tacoma, came from Puyallup, pulled out onto Interstate 5, and I'm driving along in my Abeka van. And all of a sudden, there was this little boy, I, I just, you know, looking back and forth, and I noticed there was this car, SUV, right next to me. And there was this little gap tooth, six, six year old, waving and doing all kinds of things, and hi, and, and everything else. And I thought, what did I do? You know, did I run his mother off or something? Because she was waving at me too. <laughs> the next thing he did was hold up to the window a video manual. A Becca book homeschool. <laughs> It was a good day, <laughs> the rest of the day. I have no idea who that little guy was. Don't know his name. I'll meet him in heaven. But I'll tell you this, he's why I do what I do. And he's why your wife does what she does. Don, she's what we do. It's because of little ones like that. That's why we do what we do. It's because of our lost neighbors. <laughs> Learn to see real miracles when they occur. Not the fobbed off ones we see on TV. Well, today's Valentine's Day. And I want to share with you a little something that we have here. And what it is it has to do to close with this very thing. Remember I said... One of the characteristics is, is you put on meekness. Power and a willingness to stand. Well, who was Valentine? Well, the year was about 270 AD. And the Roman Emperor was Claudius II. And Claudius II was not a Christian by any stretch. He thought that it was a bad idea in his mind. I want men, and he passed a law, made a mandate. <laughs> in Rome, there will be no marriage. None. Why is that? Because... We need little warm bodies to grow up to be soldiers. And if men are married as Christians and others to one woman, then we'll have less babies to grow up to be soldiers. This is the way this emperor's warped brain thought. And so we ban marriage of all things. Well, there happened to be a pastor in Rome in that area. And his name was Valentinius. And Valentine, or Valentinius, believed the ban on marriage was unjust. 
It was for the wrong reasons. And of course, the Bible speaks against polygamy and, every, and, and adultery and everything else. And he said, no. I'm going to continue to perform Christian marriages. Even though the emperor's decree is nada. You don't do that. Well, eventually Claudius II discovered Valentine and had him arrested. But then the story gets interesting. Claudius II at first was impressed by his conviction and his dignity. But he was grateful, he was absolutely angered by the pre continued refusal to obey the decree and the reluctance to follow the Roman gods. In his rage, Valentinius sentenced him to death. Why prison awaiting his execution? Four times jailer was a man by the name of Asterius. Asterius. And he had a daughter named Juliana, who had a disease of the eyes. She was partly blind. And he mocked, Christerius mocked Valentinus. Well, a little more than the wall, some water. And strong faith in his God. He told him to bring the girl to him. And the history panels say that he did. Valentine wet his hands, did kind of what Jesus did, spit in them, prayed, wiped her eyes, and in a matter of days, She was healed. Well, that reverberated in that jail. And Austerius became a Christian and his family. But it didn't change the heart of Claudius II. And he was ordered to be executed three ways. Be beaten, be tortured. By that you would say, we would call it the rack. And then be beheaded. And that was done over multiple days. In the letter Valentinius penned to Juliana, he wrote her a goodbye. Said that she should be strong in her faith. And he signed it, your Valentine. And that's how we have Valentine's today. That's how it happened. And you can read, there's the Chronicles of Nuremberg, there's uh, church history of the, of, on the Lutheran side, the Greek Orthodox, the Catholic Church, they all have this type of thing. It's, there's multiple incidents of this sort of thing being there. That's where it comes from. Yes, in Rome, certainly there were pagan things and we have Cupid and all of that. But we don't talk about St. Cupid's Day. 
we talk about St. Valentine's. And he was a priest, or a pastor, whatever you want to call him, who stood his ground and paid the ultimate price. Let us have that kind of conviction as we put on righteousness and we pass through life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the testimony of saints who have gone by. Thank you for testimonies of people who love you and care for you. Thank you for encouraging us at times when things seem bleak. Teach us to look ahead and look forward to your coming. Draw us to yourself this day. If some be, be here that do not know you as Savior and Lord, we pray that you would move by your Spirit. and redeem them even now. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And finally...